Welcome to Computer Science E1. My name is David Malin, and tonight is all about the internet. But first, you'll recall in problem set one, the challenge that was page one of the problem set perhaps gave a few of you a bit of a panic if you did not take our advice at the top of the problem set to read ahead as you're taught in grade school to read all the questions before you tackle the first. Um, Consider, if you did find that a bit frustrating and didn't realize until an hour later that you, when you turned page two that it was not requisite to translate all of the binary, that uh, two or three years ago when we first played this little trick or this little scare tactic, it was actually just random sequences of zeros and ones on the first page because it did not occur to me that anyone would bother taking the hour or two to translate all of these codes. And needless to say, that semester's student body was far more frustrated than any of you might have been this year. So I hope that by spoiling the extra credit in the question three, you at least got something out of it. This is, I think, the last year, though, that I will put my phone number on the problem set. Um, <laughs> I have been inundated with phone calls this week, people not knowing who they're calling, apparently, and just expecting some kind of prize, I think, at the other end. Um, but indeed, the extra credit decrypted to my phone number, which is on the syllabus and on the course's website, and the hope was that that's where your answer would come from. But I didn't mind the late night phone calls either. So it was good to chat with many of you. Um, so tonight is about the internet. And I introduce this to you by way of two distant students who will soon greet you uh, themselves. We'll talk first about instant messaging, which is a technology that's relatively simple in concept, but has been increasingly popular, both in the workplace as well as in personal environments. Out of curiosity, how many of you use instant messaging regularly? OK, so a handful of you. The most popular clients these days are AOL Instant Messenger, uh, MSN Messenger, Yahoo Messenger. ICQ used to be quite popular for a while, sort of fading out, though Europeans and Asians tend to still use it more so than Americans. Um, Google Talk is perhaps the newest of these, and we'll demonstrate that tonight. So first, let's say hello to a gentleman by the name of Brian, if we can get him on the line here. He is logged into a program called iChat. And I am logged in here on a program called AOL Instant Messenger. Everything we do is freely available on the internet. All of these accounts are free. The software is free. So let's see, by double clicking on Brian, who I've added in advance to my buddy list, if we can get him on the line. So hello, Brian. To contextualize this a little bit, what I've effectively just done, having logged in as screen name CSCIE1, which is the free account I signed up for, I have sent a message to Brian by double clicking his name, entering it into this window. That message behind the scenes was transmitted to AOL's server. It was then forwarded from their server to Brian's personal Macintosh, where he received my message, and now we've just received his. So fortunately, you can turn these sounds off, because they uh, tend to get rather annoying back and forth. But we are now live, if you'd like to say hello. I'm going to blow this window up so you can see a bit better. I've increased the font size. Um, I would not do that in normal conversation, since it's uh, the equivalent of bad netiquette, as we'll discuss today. But let's see if you'd like to say hello by voice. Among the features here are not only these text transmissions, but also video. Let's see if we can get them on the line. So my laptop here has a tiny little webcam, an internet camera built into it. Brian's does too. So what I've just clicked on is the video button. The software sent an invitation, a little pop-up window to his software, where he can say, would you like to talk with CSCIE1 via webcam? He has just said yes clearly. Hopefully, we'll soon see an image from him. If I click on this My Camera tab, we can see, though not quite yet, we should be able to see myself. Let's see how long this takes to come live. OK, Brian, can you hear us? No? You can also see when he's actually typing. So he said no. Let's try again. Could you try connecting to us? There's unfortunately um, 
a bit of fidgeting sometimes required with these technologies for reasons of firewalls and so forth. When Brian and I tested this this weekend, it actually worked well when he initiated the request. So I've just gotten a message, do you want to accept this invitation from Brian? I'm going to go ahead and click accept. And now cross my fingers that this demo actually works. Oops. On it. Try again. So we're not behind a firewall here on campus, so hopefully this will, in fact, work. Better? There we go. Hello, Brian, can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, you can't quite see everyone. Hopefully you can see me. I'm going to click to my view. This is, you can see me as well, Brian? Uh, no. Hmm. All right, an imperfect technology, but we can see you, and awkward as this might be for you, if you'd like to say a few words to the class, everyone's staring up at you on the big screen. On the big screen? Indeed. <laughs> Where are you calling us from, Brian? I'm calling from Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona, so that's pretty good. Not very high latency. And do you use instant messaging video particularly with many people? Interesting. Well, it's working quite well. Let me ask our audience if anyone would like to ask a question of you. Yes? No? Yeah, one question. How's the weather? How is the weather there was the question. Nice right now. Nice right now? 78, 80 degrees. Wow. Well, we'll let you get back to work. We're going to call someone up now on G Talk, a Google Talk. But thanks very much for tuning in. All right. You can watch this recording uh, later this weekend. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. All right. Very nice. So now we're going to call up another student by the name of Ken. We're going to use a, a different instant messaging client that was recently released by Google, similarly free. It's more in its beta phase, and it's got much few, many fewer features than AOL Instant Messenger, which frankly I think is a good thing. It's quite simple. You can use G Google Talk simply by having a Gmail account. And I similarly have a little talk message here. And I'm going to say, hello, Ken and see if we can get him on the line. All right, so the motivation for Google Talk is that even though that worked rather well with Ken, particularly with video, although uh, with Brian, although only in one direction, Google Talk, of all of the clients that personally I've experimented with, works incredibly well. For instance, case in point, just last night, I was talking quite late at night, but quite early for him, with a friend who is currently working in uh, Dubai in the United Arab Emirates and it sounded just like a typical phone call might and it costs zero so it is quite an impressive technology let's see if we can call him up indeed hi is Ken there please hey yes sir how are you doing Ken you sound brilliant here the quality is really good you've got the whole class here listening to you well that's fantastic thing <laughs> well, you don't have video, which Brian just had for us, but would you like to say a few words to the class about yourself and where you are? Uh, sure. I'm uh, in Alexandria, Virginia. I uh, am starting a new uh, web and print design <coughs> company right now. Uh, I also am a full-time professional umpire. An umpire, yes? Well, excellent. Yes. Well, uh, let me turn to the audience and see if they have any questions for you, Ken. I'm sorry? What did you last umpire, Ken? What did I last umpire? Oh, uh, well, it's, it's uh, all ball. I don't do professional games, do anything from uh, lower level, lower level. Excellent. <laughs> well, we got a lot on tonight's agenda, but thank you so much, Ken, for tuning in. This sounds great. Uh, All right, we'll talk to you soon. So, as I think just the mere quality of the audio attests, 
Google has done a really nice job, to their credit, in getting this to work. And more so, I found, than MSN Messenger and Yahoo Messenger and AOL Instant Messenger, Google Talk, thus far in my experience, works the best behind firewalls in particular. A common problem for people trying to do internet telephony is that if you're sitting at home behind your home router, aka a firewall, and the other person is doing the same, too often with these other clients can you not initiate the connections, essentially because you're both hidden behind these home routers. Google Talk seems to have transcended that problem particularly well, so I would encourage you to try this out. And Gmail is still officially in beta form. Gmail is just a freely available email account, um, like Hotmail or Yahoo Mail. You, it's only by invitation only, so you have to ask someone who has a current Gmail account if they can send you a free invitation. The E1 account now has 20 or 100, so if you have no friends with Gmail but would like one to try this out, just drop us a note and we'll send you the invitation from our account. So it's pretty wild. More interesting than just the demonstration of it, I think, is a discussion of how technologies like this work. And so what we're going to do tonight is focus more on the application layer on the internet, what you can do with it, how it works, how you would generally go about setting up some of these services like websites. Next week, we'll take the hood off of the internet, just as we did with hardware, look underneath it all, how actually the data has been getting from us to Brian and back and to Ken as well, talking about things like routers and TCP IP and firewalls and the like. But first, I think in appreciation of the effort you put into your problem sets one, I think rather than the dum dum pops that we started the course off with, you at least now qualify for uh, some nerds candy instead. So I'm going to pass this around. Feel free to engage in a bit of a treat as we proceed. And with that said, why don't we uh, let's have a chat about the internet? There seems to be a particular interest this semester in all things security related. So rather than start with email in the form of the to field and the CC field and the subject field, which might be a bit mundane, I thought we'd start with some of the emails I've been collecting over the past few months for the purposes of this course, specifically so that we can look at email through the lens of bad guys and looking at things like spam and at uh, phishing attacks such as the ones you're about to see here. One of the earliest emails I received back in, um, well, this was copied over, let's see, just a few days ago, actually, this PayPal email. What I've done is I've connected to my email account, the courses account, and I have pulled this up with a program called Outlook, which many of you probably use. A first interesting question to motivate our security discussions, ultimately, would be this first one of why is there a broken link at the top of this email in the form of that red X? Those of you who use Outlook might often see such broken image icons in an email. But why is it broken? Yeah? Could be related to some unsupported ActiveX control, which is a, a scripting technology that we'll come back to. Could be another suggestion. It turns out that this is actually a good thing, that Outlook is blocking my ability to actually see the PayPal logo that is embedded into this email. The curious thing about emails over the past few years is that no longer are they simple text messages like they were predominantly a few years ago. Rather, they're pretty much web pages, single web pages sent to you in the form of an email. And today's email programs like Outlook or Eudora or Netscape Mail have the ability to actually display emails as though you had pulled up a web page with a browser. Well, the reason that Outlook is blocking our ability to see this image is because this, the embedding of images, is a common technique that spammers use, that companies use, that fishers use, we'll come back to these terms, to determine if you in fact exist and if you in fact got this particular email. Because if this image had been automatically downloaded along with the email, it turns out the image was not sent with the email. Rather, embedded in this email is what's called a hyper-reference to the image. The image exists somewhere on a web server, presumably PayPal's web server. In this email, for efficiency reasons, there's just like a little pointer to that image that essentially tells the email program, when the user wants to view this message, go download that image and then display it to the user thereby making it faster for me to download the email because I only download the image on demand and they're not sending out millions of copies of the same image if it doesn't change in the first place. But what happens the moment I sir, go around PayPal's or rather Outlook's security feature and click 
as I'm doing now, download pictures. Well, the email now looks intact, but what has just happened from a security perspective? Exactly. My computer now, by having chosen download image, has done just that. It's downloaded the image from the server. Now, if that image has a more interesting name than paypal.gif or paypal.jpg, but rather has a file name of something like mailin at eecs.harbor.u.gif, well, what you've essentially just informed the web server is that that guy that you sent that copy of the link to does exist because he just checked his mail. And this is how spammers tend to operate. They will spam randomly chosen addresses. This is how a lot of you with Hotmail accounts or even Gmail accounts sometimes get spam even if you have never told anyone other than your mother what your email address is. It's they've randomly generated the address. And just by chance, M-A-L-A-N happens to be a real username. And so it got into my inbox. Unfortunately, I have just now informed this spammer or PayPal, yes, I exist, so next time, why don't you send me your spam in more volume? Because I do exist. You needn't randomly choose me. Now, the more interesting question is, is this in fact from PayPal? Well, it says the following. Looks pretty legit. We've got PayPal's real logo. Dear PayPal member, it has come to our attention that your PayPal billing information records are out of date. Dot, dot, dot. All of it looks pretty official. In fact, it looks quite like PayPal's own website. And it's asking me clearly to click here to activate your account. All right, seemingly innocuous. It appears to have come from who? Well, service at PayPal.com. That clearly looks legitimate. But notice what happens, at least with Outlook, if I just hover over this link. Well, you see in this little yellow pop-up the true destination that I will end up at if I click this link. Now, unfortunately, even that is not glaringly worrisome because it appears to be taking me to HTTP colon slash slash some number slash US slash account verification. Still looks pretty legit, if cryptic, if over one's head. But unfortunately, that address, that number, does not belong to who? PayPal. In fact, if we click on this thing, thereby giving me more spam tomorrow, we have just arrived at what appears to be PayPal's website. In fact, it's almost a perfect copy of it. But notice the URL. It doesn't say PayPal.com, but it could be PayPal's address. But the fact that they didn't use www.paypal.com suggests, or should suggest to you after tonight, not PayPal. This is some random guy on the internet that apparently hasn't even been shut down yet. Um, by the feds or by whatever country it exists in this computer because this website is still operational. What these folks have done is made a perfect copy of PayPal's site. If I now type in my email address and then my password hit submit, that information is not going to PayPal. It's going to whatever trickster is running this website. With your username and password, guess what he can then do? He can then go to the real PayPal.com, log in as you with your email address, your number, and then spend whatever funds happen to be in your PayPal account. For those unfamiliar, PayPal is a, a sort of like an online bank account that allows you to pay for things via credit card or via cash that's sitting in your account. So this is equivalent to giving someone the PIN to your ATM card, but in the virtual world. So what might the lesson be from a demonstration such as this for you, the home user? All right, go to the official web page always if you want to pull up such an account. In fact, most company, many companies these days are finally getting smart about not including links in their emails, encouraging customers to follow them because that renders their customers susceptible to exactly this. This is called a phishing attack, where essentially someone is trying to hook you by sending something that looks legitimate. They want you to click and respond, but they're really just trying to lure you in under false pretenses. Now, a lot of companies are still rather foolish about this, like Citibank, for instance. A real bank does tend to use, at least as of recently, real links in their emails. Why? Well, this is useful. It means I can click on, for instance, an email informing me that my latest statement has posted, and then I can very quickly log in. And I don't need to open up Internet Explorer and type in HTTP colon slash slash www.citibank.com. But companies have been teaching customers to do this which is bad because now you have people trying to prey on that same training and attack people in the same way. So to clarify the lesson, well, one thing, if you do get such an email, 
That's fine. Maybe it is legitimate. But pull up the website yourself. Manually type in paypal.com, and you're much more likely to actually then be safe. In the email? Well, so this one too. As you'll see when we start making web pages, what you show the user and where the link goes are two different things. And it's merely a deceptive coincidence that the aesthetics look like a URL of a website, but really it's going to lead you elsewhere. But you have to beware too, because a smarter fisher might do what? Well, they might embed some actual links in this email. For instance, had they been smarter, they might have let this link go to the real paypal.com, having only the yellow link go to the bogus site, embedding there all the more credibility, thereby sort of convincing the user, yeah, this is legitimate. But consider the cost of sending these emails out. As you've probably read, sending spam costs pennies to email millions of people effectively. I mean, the marginal cost of spamming one more person is zero, which means if you send out a million of these emails, well, it's fine if most people delete them, even if a lot of the addresses are bogus, because consider if just 1% of those emails reach real users that actually click on them. 1% of 1 million, what, 10,000 people's accounts have you just accessed? And that's pretty good for you know, a day's work that didn't cost you anything. So let's take a look at another. The next email that I received somewhat recently looked like, let's see. Well, this, let's, let's take a step back, make it a little less scary. So how about these emails that you might get? Um, maybe a nice cute note even written by your friend and then something dot, dot, dot. Send this to everybody you know. Send this to everybody in your address book. Maybe even disclose that you're a doofus and put your name in the email and then forward it along. I mean, what are these the equivalent of? These are 21st century chain letters. They just don't happen to cost you know, 21 cents in stamps anymore, but it's the exact same thing. And if there's one thing we teach you tonight, please no longer be one of the people that takes these emails at face value and forwards them along, even if it's the dying wish of a young cancer patient in a hospital who just wants to see this email go around the whole world and get back to him. I mean, I didn't mean to make fun of things like that because it's exactly the same kinds of chain letters that have been going around for years. When you get such an email, it's nothing official. It's nothing organized. It's just a bunch of people, frankly, with a little too much time. Um, with that said, at the risk of having just offended half the folks of you who like your internet forwards, um, that's all they are. All right, more security conscious, perhaps. Um, what about this one? So this one looks like it's from Amazon. Uh, Outlook has again protected me by preventing the download of these images. Let's go ahead and disclose that that is actually me. Um, now, what would you do with an email like this? Less confusion here. There's just text. So how do you determine if this is legitimate? Using Outlook, if you happen to use it. Well, again, you can do this simple hover trick. Right? Fortunately, Outlook does do this. And <laughs> this one's going to a website where? In Japan, right? .jp means Japan. So whoever's hosting this website is outside the control of the US authorities, which uh, suggests, incidentally, that a lot of the discussion these days in politics about making phishing and spamming illegal, it's all really rather a waste of time, because you can regulate Americans, perhaps, but no one offshore. And this will not stop the problem. Case in point, you're going to a website that in, exists in Japan. This was as of October 1st. Again, goes to a real website. No one has shut this one down yet. If I enter my Amazon information and my Amazon password, bam, I've just disclosed that information. And appreciate that with that are sometimes stored things that are more useful than your mere Amazon account name and password, but the last credit card you used. So that someone in Japan might be able to log in, use the last credit card you used to buy something. So again, recipient beware. And in fact, I mean, we can be so specific as to know the username of the guy who's running this website, because almost always anything after a tilde, as in the small URL up top, D-A-I-S-U-K-E, well, that's the username of whoever is running this particular website. It's not hard to figure out who they are, but it's tougher sometimes to actually shut them down and find out uh, who to <laughs> contact to shut them down. Well, we could do this all day long. Let's pick one more representative one. As you see, I have one here from Chase Manhattan. I have one from another from PayPal, Semantic Security, eBay, Citizens Bank. Um, 
Kate McDonald, McDiarmond, um, how about we pick on this one? So this is clearly one with a lot of pictures. Let's go ahead and download them all. This was sent to me as a valued customer from a company called Symantec, same company that makes Norton Utilities, which we discussed two weeks ago, and they also make antivirus software, which we'll talk about a few weeks hence. This is telling me that my antivirus software has expired, so clearly I should follow some link and download the latest version. That may be true in some cases, but most companies these days would not solicit you directly and have you follow a link in an email. Similarly, if you've received emails ever from Microsoft announcing the newest bug in their software or the newest virus threat plaguing the internet, please download this Microsoft patch. Microsoft is not so benevolent as to email you, the customer, when something is wrong with their software. When you receive emails informing you to ever install software on your computer, do not do it. It is almost always someone trying to dupe you. And case in point, if we follow one of these links, um, let's see where we end up. Available via Live Update. So Live Update is a semantic product, but semantic does not run, I would bet, bluehornet.com. So again, beware. So let's take a step back. We've dived into a security-oriented discussion of email. I don't think we're in a day and age where we need to spend much time talking about what email is. But what about how it works behind the scenes? So when you actually click send on an email, where does it go? How does that work? Well, here's me sitting at what I'm going to call my client. A client computer is usually one that is doing the requesting or the sending of information unsolicitedly. And we're going to contrast this with, take a guess, what kind of computer? Yeah, so a server. So on the internet and in the computer world in general, there's this inherent sort of relationship between clients and servers where the client, like a customer in a restaurant, is typically requesting information or providing information to a server. And the server then responds either with an acknowledgment that it received the information or with the information being requested itself. So I click send in my email program here. What happens to that email? Well, it does get, in fact, get transmitted to a server like this. The type of server that it's typically transmitted to, though, which is of more relevance to you, a user, is usually called an SMTP server, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Well, you might have seen this if you have like a Comcast account or a Verizon account, and you need to configure your Comcast.net email account for the first time. Well, among the pertinent pieces of information a company, an ISP, will give you is what is the address of your SMTP server? What is the address of your incoming mail server? Well, suffice it to say that an SMTP server, as the arrow suggests, is an outgoing mail server. By contrast, if I want to receive my emails, in other words, I sit down at my computer late at night, having been at work all day, and I want to download all of my personal emails to my computer, well, I'm going to make that request of another type of computer, and that's usually called one of two things. It's either a POP server or an IMAP server. The distinction being, POP is probably the more common. A POP server, post office protocol, is just an email server with, that when you tell it, give me my email, it sends all of your emails over the internet down to your computer and then usually, but not always, deletes the emails from the server so that the only copy that henceforth exists is on your client computer. You can change that, but eventually if you leave all your emails on the server, you'll run out of space and then typically you'll have to deal with that in some fashion. An IMAP server, by contrast, sort of increasingly popular. And I think, frankly, for anyone who checks their mail from multiple locations, this is the ideal. Because what an IMAP server does is it's similarly an incoming mail server. I, the client, would request my email from an IMAP server, just as I would a POP server. But an IMAP server synchronizes. So that if I delete an email on the client, it simultaneously gets deleted here. If I for instance, send an email from my client, the copy of it also gets saved here. Now, the beauty of this sort of system is the following. I can sit down at my home, check my email, and then quit my email program. Then I can go off to work, log into my same email account, and even if I read all of those emails originally on my client, they're still stored on the server. But 
anything that I deleted on the client was similarly deleted on the server so that I have this unified view, no matter where in the world I am, of my inbox. Contrast this with the nuisance that is more common today of if you download your emails at home, but then you maybe via webmail connect to Comcast.net to check your mail from work. Well, sometimes you're sort of out of luck because if you want some email that you read that morning, well, if you downloaded it via pop to your local computer, it's no longer there for you. Or if you have enabled an option that allows you to leave all such emails there, then what you have is this huge compendium of old emails that you then have to sift through just trying to find the more recent ones. In short, if you have the option these days as a consumer to choose the type of email account you have, IMAP is by far more flexible. And for those of you in the corporate world or universities that use Microsoft Exchange servers, it's not IMAP per se, but it's the same idea in Exchange Server. It maintains this synchronization. Now, how many of you use free email services like Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo for your primary email account? So a lot of you. So is this picture really happening? Well, you at the client are pulling up what kind of program to access your Yahoo Mail or your Hotmail. What program would you use to check your mail? Yeah, like Internet Explorer or Netscape. You would use a browser. But in this case, any time you send an email or read an email, even though it looks to you like it's sitting on your machine, it's actually still sitting on a web server somewhere. It's sitting on Yahoo or Gmail or Hotmail server. But the picture is pretty much the same. It's just there's one additional client in the picture, which is now you sitting at this client interfacing with what's effectively a server, this being Hotmail, for instance. But in turn, when you say check for new mail, Hotmail, or any server that you're using, similarly checks its mail servers, has David received new email, stores them here to then display to you. But it's the same idea. But this is why for web-based mail, like free accounts, you don't have to even worry about configuring it because someone, Gmail, Google, Microsoft, are maintaining all these details for you. But for those of you who have email accounts through Verizon, Comcast, the picture includes only from here to the right. Okay. Questions? Yeah, I know it's the same thing that happens with me. I, was, I have a laptop and I go on and get mail from my laptop. And I you know, respond to emails and all that. Mm -hmm. Gone in what sense? So like I was on my laptop, I get back on and I, and I try and find it again because I wanted to get something from it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find it anymore. That would never happen when I do it from a laptop, but it all, always happens when I do it from a desktop. I see. It, it sounds, it's tough to say without seeing the problem, but it's quite possible that your desktop client was configured differently in such a way that the sent mail was being stored elsewhere or simply not at all. But one of those questions that you'd have to sort of be there to explain it. Probably quite unrelated to this. That's more likely a client side issue. I'm going to jump ahead in the slides and then come back to the, these networking comments just so that we can sort of formalize some of the issues related to email. Simple as the program itself might be, but we'll see next week why some of these semantics are useful. So, canonical forms of an email address, you might guess, look a little like yours. It typically comes in two forms either you have some username at some domain name. Dot .com, dot .net, dot .org, dot .edu. Well, what are these various components called? Well, the username is typically you know, the first part before the at symbol, whatever your nickname is on the system. Well, the domain name is something like Hotmail or Harvard or Gmail. And the TLD, what does TLD stand for? This is the top level domain. So the world is organized into relatively few TLDs, though they are increasing gradually over time. By far the most common, or at least most recognized today, remains which? You know, .com. And most people know .edu. People might be a little more suspicious about .net or .org or forget that that's what the address is and not .com. But .com is the most popular. But some email addresses have this added subdomain. Who, for instance, has an email address that has a subdomain Dot domain dot tld address. Yeah, all of you would be the answer. For those of you who have set up your FAS account successfully or have emailed me or the core staff have emailed us at the form username at fas.harvard.edu. 
edu. Well, what does the TLD signify, generally speaking? You can kind of guess, right? Hmm, sorry? Dot com suggested it's a business address. Sort of historically, dot net suggested it was an ISP. Dot org suggested it was something more like a nonprofit. These days, anybody and everybody can have an address ending in dot com, dot net, dot org. There are no policies involved with what domain, what kinds of people or companies use those domain names. You can buy them at will. In fact, most companies will tend to buy not just dot com, but all of those, just so that you don't have competition too similarly named to you. Yeah. Ah, dot gov is one of the few restricted TLDs. So those of you who work for the state or the feds would most likely have an address ending in dot gov. White House dot gov is a website on the internet, but it ends in dot gov. Uh, the dot gov is controlled by the U.S. government, so only government entities can have addresses, or people working for the government can have addresses in that particular domain. And there are several others, and we'll come back to those actually in a moment. Sure. Uh, .mil Indeed, that's one of the earliest ones, .mil, but not often seen unless you know folks in the military with email addresses. Yep, that's what all of the U.S. Army service, oh, U.S. military services use. Well, let's take some examples here. Are any of these email addresses syntactically invalid? In other words, are these all legitimate email addresses, assuming someone you know, is sitting behind that email account? Put another way, are there any typos in these email addresses? Question, yeah. It's a good question. In fact, you can have the periods before the at symbol. They don't have special meaning like they do after the at symbol. They're simply treated like any other character. So in fact, a lot of people working for companies or universities will have addresses of the form, for instance, david.malin at harvard.edu, or Harvard uses underscore. So uh, we have Harry Potter, Harry underscore Potter at hogwarts.edu. Similarly, um, simply a placeholder for my, what might otherwise be, in normal context, a space. In fact, what is absent from all of these examples? Just that. Spaces are not allowed in an email address. And for the most part, a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, only the characters you see in the email addresses up here are actually legitimate. Most special punctuation marks are not valid. Question? You can. Dashes are, in fact, valid. That is a legitimate email address. And in fact, Anakin dash Skywalker would be, again, fitting the format the username. That's what he would type to log into a system. Well, what about these? Which of these are syntactically valid? Okay, Daffy Duck at LooneyTunes.com, not valid because of the space. There would be an error when sending this, or it would bounce back to you. It's missing the TLD. Have to have the TLD. So that is invalid. What about the third? Eh, interesting. What do you think? You're suspicious. But what's your conclusion? It's OK. Turns out that though the convention typically is to write things in lowercase on the internet for email addresses and web addresses, it's case insensitive for the domain name, subdomain, and TLD. You can write it all in caps, as CNN.com tends to do for capital CNN dot little com, but it's irrelevant. It's more of an aesthetic decision. It will get to NBC.com no matter how you capitalize the NBC.com. And typically, it doesn't matter how you capitalize the username, though theoretically some email servers could be picky about capitalization but I don't know of any that are, simply because it would be annoying to be so sensitive. What about um, the fourth one? I should hope so, right? That's how you've been emailing me. How about the fifth? I'm seeing some head shakes. Why? It is. It is an address. It's actually legitimate, though. So .us is a valid TLD, and what the US has done with its 
um, municipal domains is they've divided them, for the most part, into states. So there is a ma.us for all of Massachusetts. There is a ct.us for all of Connecticut, a ca.us for all of California. Inside of each of the states, then, they manage other subdomains. So Franklin, Franklin, Massachusetts, is a town in which there's clearly an email server because this is valid. And so uh, the teachers, for instance, at Franklin High School, which is actually a school I used to work at, would have addresses of this form. Completely legitimate. Yeah? So who would be housing this server in Franklin? Um, who would be housing this server in Franklin? The short answer is I don't recall. Um, most likely it would be someone in the school system or it could be the state itself. For instance, uh, Massachusetts email system is a Microsoft Exchange server-based system. So almost everyone in state.ma.us whether you're local or working elsewhere in the state, are all managed on the same dysfunctional servers um, that are managed somewhere, I think, in the Boston area. It's unclear from an address alone where it would be managed. It could theoretically be housed anywhere on the internet, but I don't know specifically here. What about the last one? No, Yahoo might use the exclamation point in their marketing, but it is an invalid character in an email address, so it is not possible to write someone via means like that. Well, I mentioned this word before. This is sort of one of these terms that's only cropped up in recent years. This is an example of an email that is bad netiquette. Why? It's all caps, okay? All caps, for whatever reason, has come over the years to be interpreted as yelling. So when you write in all caps, even if it's an accidental caps lock, as seems to happen when my dad writes me sometimes, it's as though the person is yelling. And you should, generally speaking, if I can get back on my soapbox, delete the message and retype it normally um, in lowercase, if only because um, that is at least how people tend to interpret such things these days. You can see um, an example here, too, of spam, which we came across earlier. This is one that's gone around for quite some time. Um, notice that a lot of spam, unlike the examples we saw earlier, they tend to also come from seemingly cryptic or bogus email addresses. The reason being either they're randomly generated, hence the seeming randomness of them, or the user just doesn't want any sort of association with their name, certainly, and just chooses some random sequence of characters. Another popular one, somewhat germane here, if you're getting tired of actually submitting problem sets, well, you can just go online and uh, order a diploma from uh, this or any other school, or by calling the numbers that were once in this email as well. Um, but notice, just a few years ago, this was more like the spam you would get. These days, much more colorful, much more web page based, much more interactive, if not dangerous. Right. 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 It's a good point. Unfortunately, whatever regulations exist, there's no reason the spammers can't mimic them as well, creating bogus addresses using legitimate addresses. So again, all of these Congress-based measures to regulate spam and phishing are really fundamentally failed. It's the technology that needs to change, not the laws, unless you're just interested in cracking down on Americans. But it's too easy and cheap to just go offshore with a server of your own. Um, this year I bought uh, some Norman Internet Security. Okay. It is. So this gentleman just said, for those of you following along at home, uh, bought Norton utilities with spam, anti-spam protection. Yeah, a lot of these products are pretty good. Unfortunately, they're always one step behind the spammers, which means you need to update them frequently. Um, for instance, on my email account, I mean, I probably receive 100 or more spams a day, but most of them, nicely enough, end up in my quote unquote probably spam folder, which I glance at for maybe five seconds a day, but I haven't seen a false positive in there, an email that shouldn't be in there in many weeks. And this is because the computer science department manages this particular product that they use, and they tend to work well. I would absolutely recommend programs like that. Hotmail and Gmail, they all have built in anti spam technologies. Unfortunately, they don't always work perfectly. So it's sort of 
trial and error. And sometimes you do want to check the folder called spam lest an email from your mom have ended up in there since your mom mentioned keywords that shouldn't appear in emails. Or this is actually an interesting point. If you've ever seen, and we haven't seen an example of this, have you ever gotten an email where it might be some kind of advertisement, but then at the bottom there's all these random words, like someone was having way too much fun with a thesaurus, completely unrelated to the email. Yes? No? Well, keep an eye out for this if you haven't seen it. Those are attempts on spammers' parts to avoid detection by spam programs. Because what spam programs will typically do is look for too much of a frequency of mentions of money, or dollar signs, or Viagra these days, or diplomas, any of these keywords typically associated with spam. So if you bulk up your email by including some random words from the dictionary, literally, well, that lowers the frequency of the worrisome words, and thereby the program might decide, yeah, this is about Viagra, but maybe they're discussing Viagra. I should let it through. So these are some of the anti-anti-spam techniques. Another is manifest in this example. Notice how is diploma spelled? With spaces. That is a trivial attempt to avoid detection because it doesn't say diploma. It says d, d space, i space and so forth. All of these little techniques come into play. Misspellings of words are often used simply to evade spam detection. So if my address is spam addition in the morning, mm -hmm. um, and I decide to get a Hotmail account, mm -hmm. um, my morning is a Hotmail account just on my server, and how is, the, how is my anti-spam going to help me in that respect? It would not, is the short answer. If you are using web-based mail, no locally installed software is going to help you unless you are downloading the email with like Outlook or Eudora from Hotmail or Gmail or Yahoo because some of those websites allow you not only to visit the website to check your mail but also configure the POP and SMTP server and manually download it. Then it would become relevant but otherwise you need to trust Yahoo's and Hotmail's filters and Hotmail in particular is god awful. It does not work well. They're spam techniques. As an aside, I was talking with someone in the extension school the other day who has received one or more personal emails from um, Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates. And Bill Gates is reputedly the most emailed man in the world, such that he gets one million emails a day. Many of these are probably spam, right? Who better to spam than someone you're annoyed at for whatever reason? Um, but just the sheer computer science task of sifting through those emails so that he can actually use email as a technology is remarkable. And I'm sure they throw both computers at this and low paid interns at reading through his emails. Um, but it's a remarkable problem. So if you think your spam is bad, just consider um, other figures in the world, perhaps. Other questions on email? Well, this one's always fun. I'm going to ask you for just a moment to rotate your heads 90 degrees. And you will see a non-exhaustive list of these goofy little things that are called emoticons. You've probably seen several of them before. Smiley faces, winking faces, um, happy faces, tired faces. The one most germane to this university here, perhaps, is uh, maybe this one here, if you can read it. You haven't quite seen that one before, the little pointy nose. So emoticons are simply ways of taking the edge off of maybe that email you otherwise wrote in all of caps but otherwise it's just a silly convention that most people have myself included tended to adopt so email sort of a representative application one of the most popular applications by far on the internet and one of the earliest ones used back in the day let's now focus for a moment more on the networks themselves we introduced earlier this notion of clients and servers. And this is a theme that's going to recur throughout the course, really, whenever we talk about software or other hardware configurations. Um, let's try to qualify, again, exactly how things are structured on a higher level. And again, next week, we're going to take the hood off of these things and actually look at how all of this is implemented and why that is actually relevant. Well, we pretty much talked about domains in the context of email a moment ago. The blanks here are for an at-home exercise, if you will, on what domains you're familiar with and what subdomains you might have experienced. But we've enumerated a few here. We mentioned FAS before. I've mentioned POST and EECS tonight. DCE exists. Law exists. Uh, HBS doesn't exist. You have hbs.edu. The business school has its own domain name. They do not exist within harvard.edu. That's sort of a university uh, curiosity. But there are many other TLDs besides the .edu's, and this is a nearly current version. Um, 
And I thought it would be most catchy if I highlighted the, uh, the rightmost one there, the XXX, which is receiving a whole bunch of attention in the US media these days. It hasn't yet been deployed, but it's been proposed, as you might guess, for any adult-oriented websites. The other um, TLDs noted here, for the most part, are all in use. The earliest ones include .com, .edu, .gov, uh, .mil, .net, and .org. The others also exist these days. Coming into more frequent use is perhaps .info or .name. Um, .arpa was also one of the earliest ones. And then some of these are still in the so-called startup phase. They've been proposed or approved, but haven't actually been deployed yet. Ah, that's a good question. So you've probably seen some addresses of the form .tv, maybe in web addresses. But there are no two-letter TLDs on here. In fact, .us is not on here. But they are on this next page. You have here a nearly exhaustive list of every country in the world that has its TLD. It's intentionally small. You needn't get uh, specifics out of this slide, but take away that every one of these countries has its own um, two-letter TLD, typically called CC TLDs, country code TLDs, and every country by convention has the rights of managing its own TLD. Now the US, since as the inventors of the internet years ago, pretty much laid claim to managing the .coms and .nets and .gov, so only the US government uses .gov. Any other country has domains only ending in .xy, where xy is one of these two characters. But notice .tv actually comes from what country? It's small to read, but in the top right, .tv belongs to a tiny little uh, southeast Pacific country called Tuvalu, which, no joke, is a means of raising revenue sold off the rights to its country code because in the English-speaking world, .tv has some very useful commercial applications. You know, m.tv or ed.tv or any TV show these days that wants a website started to gravitate toward this domain for the mere fact that it connotes television. But it's just a little tiny country that wanted to allow other people outside of its island to register domain names. And there have been other countries that have started to do that as well. Um, but some, like .qa in Qatar, just not nearly as popular um, among the English-speaking world. So Tuvalu had the advantage there. But all of these exist. And there exist websites in almost all of these domains. In fact, you can see such examples even for US-based companies if we visit not CNN.com, but www.cn. Uh, co.jp. Which country's news am I about to get? Yeah, Japan. And if I click install, we'll actually see correct Japanese. But for now, let's just take a look at what the home page looks like. And it looks, for those unfamiliar, that is not actually Japanese. Um, <laughs> but I haven't simply installed the Japanese language pack. But clearly an example now of a US-oriented company actually having domains elsewhere. And there are certainly Japan-only companies in that domain. What tends to be the convention in a lot of countries, Japan, the UK in particular, is they've adopted this .co, .country code convention, or sometimes .com, .country code convention, simply to sort of mimic the approach that the US has taken by m naming everything in a .com realm. But .co is just shorter for some reason. So questions just on these semantics, on the jargon related to domain names. OK, because, yeah? Real quick, on the top level, you had your sponsored and reserved. What is that? So some of the domain names, as you've noted, do have some restrictions around them. And so the ones that are sponsored, for instance, are essentially managed so that you, as an individual, could not buy a domain name in .museum. They are sponsored in the sense that there is an organization that actually manages the allocation of these names, and they would deny such requests. Many of them, though, are simply um, unsponsored in that they weren't initiated, for instance, by a private group, but they might still have some restrictions. .edu has restrictions, .gov has restrictions, .mil has restrictions, and so forth. So a more fun, have you ever sort of wondered for yourself, um, how do I get my own website? I mean, maybe it's sort of been a moot point or sort of out of your means, but it's actually kind of a cool and amazingly easy thing to do these days. How would you go about getting your own domain name? You know, me.com. Yeah.
Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. Search for it and pay for it, and then it is yours. Now, there's a second step to actually using it. You then typically have to pay someone to host the domain. If you're not running your own little network in your home, you'd have to pay someone to actually manage the domain. But step one, for a long time, was simply a process of going to networksolutions.com, which by decree was the only entity in the world authorized to actually uh, register domain names for people. A few years ago, though, this power was taken away from them and distributed among private entities, which has been good for consumers in that whereas domain names three or four years ago used to cost at least $35 a pop, now you, with competition you can pay $2.99 for a year's worth of a subscription to a domain name and that is your ownership. Um, a more popular one these days, and I do believe the website is ridiculously overwhelming with the tail, is GoDaddy. Um, sort of an inherent hint at the fact that Almost all of the good domain names are taken, so this company called itself GoDaddy for some reason. But they're quite popular, their prices are quite good, and their interface is quite powerful. Ignoring all of the visual distractions and examples of how not to design a website, hone in on this little box here. What we can do is choose, now if we wish, a domain name that we'd want to register, or we can at least check if it exists. All right, quick, what domain name do we want to register tonight? Okay, CSCI E1. All right, so I'm just going to type CSCI E1. I can specify which TLD I want it in. GoDaddy has the ability to register in any one of these domains for various partnering agreements. Notice that .tv is in there, .jp is in there, but let's just go with .com, if only because when people, particularly neophytes, think of websites these days, it's the .com that still communicates that hint that this is a web address. Question? Not these days, no. You can, without restriction, register even yourself in .org, .net, um, or .com, or a couple of others as well. There are no longer such restrictions. Search. I'm going to say yes. And what we get back from here is an answer. Turns out, cscie1.com. Now, it's usually after tonight that some enterprising student buys this domain, squats, as they say, and then charges the course staff more than the $8.95 a year to get it back, but it is, in fact, available. Unfortunately, um, that is the beauty of having a fairly cryptic username like CSCIE1. If we choose something a little more reasonable, maybe CS101, which you might think connotes you know, an introductory CS class, odds are this, when we get back the response, well, that is, in fact, taken. And this is a bit of a... Um, I hesitate to say the word scam because a lot of registrars offer this. You can back order the domain, essentially paying the registrar to say, if the guy who actually owns this domain forgets to renew it or opts not to renew it year after year, let me buy it. Unfortunately, guess what they don't really tell you? It's how many other people have similarly back ordered the same domain name. So it's a scam in that I would, you're kind of throwing away $19, and I wouldn't wait 12 months to see if you can launch that new internet business of yours with the domain name you want. Um, it is particularly hard to find good <laughs> domain names these days, but that's one of the motivations for all of these new um, TLDs to be cropping up and how popular they are and what the internet looks like in 10 years will be an interesting thing to watch. Excellent question. Um, how do you know these registrars, as they are called, are legitimate? To be honest, one of the beautiful things about Google these days is it's so well done that you can usually Google the company's name. And if they are legitimate, there will be a lot of sites linking to them, recommending them. If it's not legitimate and it's a scam, they might not appear at all, or you might see negative discussions about the company. So frankly, even one of the curious tricks to avoid going to a Fisher's or a spammer's websites these days is I used Citibank for a while. And Citibank has this foolish approach of having multiple domain names, city.com, citibankonline.com, citibank.com. I mean, even I, as a consumer, don't know which is the legitimate one. So whenever I wanted to log into my bank account, frankly, I would Google Citibank, and then I would visit the top choice. Because of the power of its search rankings, I knew that was the actual legitimate one. So the same might go for a registrar. Frankly, though, GoDaddy charges typically $6.95 a year. 
tough to beat that price and isn't really necessary to shop around for domain names typically because you can usually just ask someone, where'd you buy your domain name, and go with them. So essentially, network solutions, among others, maintains ultimate control. And so there is absolutely a hierarchy so that they're not all operating independently. They must first check with the higher authority, is it available? Then they lock it, and then they sell it to someone else. So this would be step one. And you would simply enter your information. And GoDaddy, I can see it is confusing, but it is a really good price. Ultimately, you would get an email saying, you now own CSCIE1.com. I would have chosen to register this, a username and password, because what I would then need to do is sign up for what's called a web host. Now, a web host is just someone who operates a one or more servers. They're going to give me a bit of disk space and an account on this server. And what all I need to do then is simply log into my registrar account, for instance, GoDaddy's account, and I need to tell GoDaddy who is hosting my website. And I tell them this by giving them the address, the internet address, like myhost.com, of my host. And then whenever someone on the internet, no matter where they are in the world, looks up CSCIE.com, what essentially happens, and we'll elaborate on this next week, is my laptop, for instance, would query someone like Network Solutions, say, who manages CSCIE1.com. They would return an answer. My laptop would then make a second request for the actual location on the internet of my web host provider. And I only recently started tinkering around with some websites managed by my, myself. And one, curios one thing that I think is sort of fun to pass along is it doesn't even cost you that much per year. If you wanted tonight to go home and pay $6.95 for the domain name and $5 for the year to host your website, you can be up and running on the internet with your own website, a static website, for under $12. And this is one site that if you'd like to play with it, I would recommend for the reason that they give you, as you see in the column that's green, for five bucks a year, you get 50 megabytes of space. You get access to email, I believe. You get up to five gigabytes of transfer over the internet, which means people can download a lot over the year. Or you can pay $10 a year and get even much, much more. It's amazing what you can get for your money these days. Let's take a five minute break and we'll come back with more. All right, we are back. So again, tonight is about the so-called application layer of the internet, things that you can do with the internet. The web is certainly one such thing. Email is one such internet service or internet application. The web is another. And it's quite common these days for people to conflate the World Wide Web with the internet, but they are not, in fact, the same thing. What is the distinction, as you might understand it today, between the internet and the World Wide Web. Yeah. Part of the internet. OK. Let's expound on that, too. It is part, or it's run, it's a, well, I don't want to put words in the mouth. OK, fair enough. The fact that its, world, its, its name is worldwide sort of connotes the fact that it is the internet. Yes. So the internet is by far the broader concept. And the internet itself is really the physical infrastructure on top of which various applications and services run. So just as email is something you can do on the internet, so is the web something you can surf on the internet. It's again sort of at the application layer. It is not describing physical hardware or interconnections. It's simply per describing an application or service that runs on top of this so-called internet. And as you pointed out, the internet was really developed in around the 1960s by the US military. Its original name was the ARPANET, Advanced Research Projects Association, that later named DARPA for defense um, projects. 
and it was designed to allow various government institutions and later universities to intercommunicate. It wasn't really until the 1990s that it sort of caught on as a worldwide commercial and sociological phenomenon, but it absolutely had its origins in the United States, which is why, more to the point, that the U.S. continues to control the .govs, the .coms, in a sense, um, or at least most businesses based in the dot-com TLD happen to exist in the U.S., though that is not a requirement. There do exist, as we've seen, dot co, dot jp, but foreigners can absolutely register names in dot net, dot org, and dot com these days, simply because it's more of a powerful brand, the TLD, the dot com, than something like co, dot jp might be as well. Well, as the sort of notion of a web implies there are a whole lot of interconnections underlying this and all other services. And the reason for that is that the internet was designed again with a sort of militaristic um, mindset whereby if part of your network is knocked out for various militaristic reasons, you want the rest of the network to continue to function, which is why the internet today is relatively quite resilient to significant outages, even if routers, as they're called, and we'll discuss next week, are out for electrical reasons, for flooding reasons, whatever, the internet tends to adapt pretty well to such breakages in parts of it because you have many different paths from A to B. Typically, you only use one such path, but other paths do exist. And we'll see, in a real sense, some of these paths next week, and we'll actually trace data from here to Japan, to the UK, perhaps, and just down the street to Somerville or to Cambridge. But the web for tonight is just an application that runs on top of the internet, just as email addresses allow you to address individuals by way of email addresses on the internet. So do these things called URLs allow you to address websites on the web. Well, the canonical form of a web address, or more properly, a uniform resource locator, URL, is the following. Some protocol, colon, slash, slash, then the machine that you want to access content from, and then the path. Now, the machine would be described how? How have we seen? Yeah, but with the TLD, with the domain name, maybe with the subdomain, every computer on, computer on the internet has an address. It's actually a numeric address, which is a detail we'll uh, focus on next week. But for the most part, in so far as humans are concerned, they're unique names, like www.cnn.com or just cnn.com, domains and TLDs and subdomains. The path would include what? Everything after the first, sl the rightmost slash. What do we mean by path? Yeah. Exactly, the specific file or the folder or directory on the web server whose content you want to access. Meanwhile, protocol at the left is almost always, so far as you know it, what? <laughs> HTTP. The protocol, in generally speaking, is simply a language that two computers speak. So in fact, we've seen protocols tonight. When I, a client, request my email from an email server, what we're speaking is a language or a protocol called POP or IMAP. When I transmit an email to be delivered elsewhere in the world to an SMTP server, more specifically, I am communicating with this server using the language or protocol called SMTP. It is specific to the internet, and it's specific to the type of service you're trying to access. So it's essentially a language that both my browser or my email program know how to speak and a language that the server knows how to speak. From the user's perspective, you don't care what the bits actually look like going across the wire. All you care is that you get back the day's news or you get back the day's email. But what's going on behind the scenes is sort of a standardization of two computers speaking some common language that the human himself does not need to speak. Now, most of the time when you visit sites on the web, it's HTTP colon slash slash. But a URL, even though nine times out of ten it refers to websites, can refer to any internet protocol. You might even have seen protocols like FTP, file transfer protocol. This is just another type of service that the internet allows for that allows you to transfer files from client to server or vice versa. So if you wanted to access such a server to download or upload files, you could do, for instance, FTP colon slash slash, say, fas.harvard.edu. There exist other protocols. SSH is one that you'll see in section and workshop. Um, Telnet 
is an older one that's no longer used really because of its insecurity. Gopher was a really old one used 10 or 20 years ago. Um, SMTP, properly speaking, is a protocol, but you wouldn't really address it with a URL like that. So suffice it to say, a URL is something much more general than what we typically use it for. It's almost always used in the form of website addresses. Here might be some representative examples. All of these are valid URLs, but notice not all of them are HTTP. The bottom one, like my example above, suggests that ftp.foo.com is a server that is running an FTP service. It's a server with which I can download and upload files. Well, let's take note of some of the capitalization issues. Is there any fundamental difference between examples two and three? Capitalization. Will they bring up different websites? Will one produce an error? No. No difference. Uh, domain names, TLDs, subdomains are case insensitive. It does not matter. What about the difference between example one and example two? It works, but what? It works. It Almost always. The short a question often asked is, must a website start with www? The answer is no. Must, uh, why is it typically there? Convention. People have come to expect that writing www means this is a website. And this was a useful thing, particularly a few years ago when you know, your, your mother might look at a www.cnn.com. Like, what is that? But over time, the www came to connote uh, this is a web address. Prior to that, a few years ago, you would see ads not just containing www.cnn.com, but HTTP colon slash slash www.cnn.com. Why have we migrated away from even advertising the HTTP colon slash slash? It's too much stuff, right? It's too much for mom to remember. And I, my mom's actually rather savvy, so I don't mean to pick on her. I mean the mother in the general sense. But it's too much for the consumer to have to bother remembering, even though to visit a website it is required to specify the protocol. Most browsers today they put it in for you. You just type www.cnn.com, hit enter. What happens? Well, the URL very quickly changes to prepend HTTP to it, only because the browser is assuming that is the protocol you want. But it is not required to be HTTP. It's just a convenience. Whether or not www.cnn.com and cnn.com lead to the same place is completely dependent on the system administrators. It is not a guarantee that both will lead to the same place or even that both will work. In fact, there are many sites on the web where CNN dot, where something.com does not work for some reason. And you actually have to put in the www, which is a nuisance. Good question. The browser would only automatically insert it if you did not specify explicitly. It won't change the protocol you specify. Good question, though. Yeah? Mm. Mm hmm. More so even, it's been around for quite some time. If you visit a website that's, whose address starts with HTTPS, the S does, connote, um, does imply security. Specifically, it implies that a protocol, and we'll come back to this in our security lectures, called SSL is in use. In a nutshell, just means that all the traffic between your browser and the server is encrypted. It's scrambled so that this is a good thing for credit card information, usernames, passwords, and so forth. That's a good thing to see typically in a website address, especially if you're inputting personal information. Another question was back here. Nope, no longer. All right, which of these is syntactically valid? Normal people infrequently. Students in this course, more frequently soon. And you'll do that in section. Um, but the commonplace uh, protocol is HTTP for the masses. No, we will use a specialized client that makes it easier than a browser. Yeah? Ah, it's an excellent question. Do the slashes, are they pointing in the wrong way? Does it matter? What does the audience think? Doesn't matter? 
it does matter officially, because that is in violation of the canonical form we just saw. Browsers these days are forgiving. They sort of expect that maybe the user doesn't know quite which one to use. The browsers will typically fix them. But properly speaking, the first one is invalid because the slashes are simply in the wrong direction. What about the second one? Yeah, it'll work because the browser is forgiving. If we want to be nitpicky, it is not a valid URL because it lacks the protocol. But it will work if it's a website that you're trying to visit. What about the third one? Oh, it ends with HTML. Worrisome? That's actually OK. In fact, most pages on the internet do, in fact, end with index.html. Case in point, if I go to CNN.com, we get the day's news. But if I go to cnn.com slash index.html, guess what I get? The day's news. So in fact, the default file name that is assumed when you visit just cnn.com is in fact index.html. And when we start to do our own website development in this course with your FAS accounts, that is precisely the very first web page that you will make, a file called index.html. But by convention, you usually don't have to type it, because in the absence of its being there, it is assumed to be the file that the user actually wants. So it turns out that number four is also legitimate. Even though it has a question mark and an equal sign and an ampersand, you would typically see URLs like that in websites that you're interacting with. For instance, if I pull up Yahoo and search for pink flamingos, notice what happens to the URL. It gets pretty crazy pretty quickly. But you see similar features. Question mark, P equals pink plus flamingos, ampersand. Essentially, all of that crazy syntax is a way of a browser passing additional input into a web server, and it happens to be visible to the user. And it happens quite frequently, but you rarely have to type such cryptic things. It all happens automatically. Finally, the last two, valid or invalid? I see some heads shaking. Why? Second to last is missing the TLD. It is invalid. And the last? It's missing a slash, so it too is invalid. So during break, it was mentioned the following search. And I would be remiss in not conveying this to all of you, as many internet forwards have done so, um, in a lecture about the web. Have you ever Googled, for instance, miserable failure? OK? So if you Google miserable failure, as you know with Google, typically the top hit is the most important one, the most authoritative one, the correct website. Well, <laughs> this is not a political slight on Google's part. This does, in fact, lead to whitehouse.gov and specifically to George W. Bush's website, his personal profile. So how in the world is that possible, assuming there's no shenanigans going on at Google? Could be a matter of redirection, but in fact, this is what you see is what you get. In fact, Google is giving you the legitimate whitehouse.gov address. And also pointed out earlier is uh, don't visit whitehouse.com by accident, though rumor has it, and I won't verify this during class while we're rolling film, um, is that it was taken down recently. Um, so that used to make for a fun demo, but not since we broadcast over the internet. So um, it was not a .gov site, let's just say. But this one, how's this working? <laughs> it's for sale right now. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. So there's a couple of tricks that Google uses. One of them is this move to front heuristic. The more you click on it, the sort of more popular it becomes. But also what people have done, and this is a true collusion effect, is a lot of people on the internet who maintain websites have created hyperlinks in their web pages, the text of which is um, miserable failure, the hyperlink for which is 
whitehouse.gov slash George Bush. So actually similar to what the spammers are doing by putting their address but associating with it the name PayPal, these guys have simply all gotten together and said, hey, let's associate miserable failure with the URL for George Bush's webpage. And enough people got together and do this, and now I'm sure even more people do it because, hey, look how fun this is. So the rankings just get stronger and stronger. And in fact, another fun one, and you got to look closely here, is if you... I, something like, we, we seem to have a, a lawyer in the audience. Um, how libelous this is, I don't know. Miserable failure is pretty innocuous. I suppose if you had die, die, die linking to someone that the um, agencies would get more involved, frankly. But this... Yeah. George Bush, if he wanted to be crafty, could go ahead and redirect that web page to be some dead link. But I'm sure people would be creative enough to come up with the new link. So unless he wants to rip his profile down altogether, he probably probably doesn't really understand what's going on anyway, frankly. But um, if he wanted to care, I think he would get more bad press, frankly, if he tried to fix the problem. But another one, in the same spirit, and no judgments here in E1, political, uh, politically neutral as we are, but if you Google weapons of mass destruction. Some other folks on the internet have had a lot of fun with this. Oh, has this changed? Weapons of mass destruction. This actually has changed. Oh, how unfun. <laughs> Weapons of mass destruction, Google hack. All right, you didn't used to have to type that. Oh, and now that's gone too. Oh, this is a shame. All right, let's see if there's a link to the old one. We might have to, but Googling for it would be a little trickier there. Um, weapons of, let's see if someone left. Oh, it's just too fun to pass up. Standard uh, weapons of mass destruction. Oh, this is a shame. Well. Essentially, and I can't do it justice verbally, have you seen the web page that Internet Explorer usually shows you when a page is not found? It'll say page not found, and then it'll give you all these cryptic things. Well, essentially, someone made a page that looked just like that and said, sorry, weapons of mass destruction not found. And then in each of the bullet points, they were no longer technical tidbits. It was actually rather amusing comments about weapons of mass destruction. Tragic that it's no longer the top. I don't know why that happened. So. Another day, I will Google around to find it. But we still have a couple of more services to go besides the World Wide Web, one of which you will actually see and use in section for a good amount of time this semester because we're going to use this to develop web pages. SSH, which just means secure shell, is another one of these internet applications. This one doesn't let you pull up web pages. It doesn't let you send emails. It allows you to control an account on one machine when you're sitting at another. So specifically, what you will soon be doing in sections and workshops or at home, if you haven't already, is logging into your FAS accounts. Well, you've all obtained, hopefully, for problem set one, or shortly will, an FAS account, a username in fas.harvard.edu. When you subsequently, perhaps with the teaching fellow's assistance, sit down at a client machine and pull up a program on a Mac called Terminal or on a PC called Secure CRT, and we'll introduce these in class, you will be communicating with a server. This server, though, is going to be one called fas.harvard.edu. What you have on this server is a username, of course, but associated with that username is what's called a home directory. You essentially have 50 megabytes of storage space freely given to you by the university that you can put anything you want in, whether it's emails or web pages. We'll use it for the latter. And you'll see in, in section and workshop how to actually create files and directories on the server. But for now, suffice it to say that what you'll do procedurally is use a program that looks a little something like this. You will then type in. For instance, fas.harvard.edu is the host name, and we'll walk you through this again. Notice that SSH1, or there's another version of this, SSH2 may be selected. Either is fine. And then you're going to click Connect. 
You're going to get some cryptic message, which you can just say OK to for our purposes. And then you're going to be asked for that username. So ours is CSCIE1. Enter. It's then going to prompt me with another message for my password. And I'm going to type in our password. And then I'm going to get this blinking prompt. Now, at first, this might take a little getting used to, since it's a little retro, if you will, actually typing all of your commands and not so much using the mouse. And what you'll find, for instance, is that when students, for instance, try to use their FAS accounts for email, you find that they say, oh, compose message. Like, it doesn't work in this age. You have to, with a Unix system or a Linux system as this is, the operating system known as Linux, only the keyboard commands will work. So if I wanted to use my FAS account to send mail, as you'll see, you could use a program called Pine, though typically folks in this course wouldn't bother with these accounts. And then you can just type an email, but rather primitive. But what you're going to do with these accounts ultimately is not so much email, unless you wish, but is the following. For instance, you are going to create, and this is going to be web page, one, web pages 101 in 10 seconds, you're going to create a file initially with a program called Pico called index.html. You are going to type. Let me make the font bigger. Uh, you are then going to type, so it's, don't start the clock yet. Now, HTML, maybe body, this is my first web page. You're then going to type a little more body with a slash, another HTML with a slash. You're going to then save it. You're going to type a cryptic command. You're then going to go to a web browser and visit www.fas, harvard.edu, slash tilde username, slash the name of the file you just created. And there's your first web page. Now, it might not happen that quickly in class, and hopefully the web pages will be a little more interesting, but that is what making web pages can be about. It's a there are different ways of approaching it. This is one of the text techniques that you will use, but you will find that there are tools these days that make making web pages a little more fun, a little more interesting than just using these terminals. But it's with these terminals that we're going to take the hood off of web pages and actually show you how they work, how you build them, and how you craft them, and how you fix things yourself. In fact, though you just saw a terribly simple example of a web page. It's representative in spirit of something even like CNN.com. If you tonight go home and pull up any web page, whoops, and then go to the View menu and go to Source, or the equivalent in Mozilla or any other browser, guess what you'll see? A whole bunch of scary looking stuff. But believe me when I say that six, eight weeks hence, you will understand this. And you will be able to write this, maybe not as quickly as perhaps I just did. And you won't have such complexity. And because, frankly, their web page is a little messy. This is not the most pretty of source code. But this is the text that makes up CNN's homepage. There's not much to it, but it probably looks like Greek to you now. But I promise you, by course's end, it will not. And you'll be able to make sites like this, sites like this, or oops, there goes the course's website. Um, we will now remove the file I just made, refresh the web page, and fortunately, the course website is back. And I do hope you've noticed that among the little aesthetic tricks the staff has spent too much time on is the logo, as your website can do too, changes every day. And one of the things we'll get to in our multimedia lectures in this course is a t challenge where as part of the assignment, you will, one, learn Adobe Photoshop, sort of the de facto graphics program in the world these days. But we'll also have you make your own banners for the website. Also in that same problem set, incidentally, if you haven't noticed already, we hold a little competition every semester, whereby in that same multimedia problem set for extra credit, you can design a candidate mouse pad entry in Photoshop, coming up with a design that you would like to see on your very own mouse pad. We will then take a vote with the class. And the most popular mouse pad, as determined by you, the students, will then go to press in quantity 80 or so. And at the very last lecture, you'll walk away with your own mouse pad. And on the website, you can see our the past three years winners. So everyone will walk home a lucky mouse pad winner. But in the meantime, we're not quite there yet. Questions on SSH or oh, I, I didn't really even tell you what SSH was, did I? So you saw me using SSH. As I said earlier, SSH is a protocol, an application that lets you control an account from one machine 
that exists on another. So that is precisely what I did. I logged into, from my client, my laptop, the fas.harvard.edu server. The files that I manipulated were here, but I was clearly manipulating them from here. And that's what SSH allows you to do, to connect to a machine, control it, perhaps only via the keyboard, but to have the changes appear here, not just on your local screen. And so that's, in essence, what SSH is. It's secure in the sense that these arrows back and forth are encrypted. So everything you do is secure. It's scrambled. No one who intercepts the transmission can figure out what you are doing. There are a couple of other internet services that are worth mentioning, even though one or more of them is rather deprecated. And you'll notice that tonight's lecture slides are really just about putting cute cartoons on the screen without actual content. That will appear in the scribe notes for tonight. But blogs. Everybody's probably heard of a blog these days, there's some ridiculous statistic, like there's 10,000 new blogs put on the internet every day, which means 10,000 more people every day have way too much time on their hands. Um, it'd be curious to see how many, pe how many of those blogs are being read every day. But a blog is short for what two words? Weblog. This is a technology, if that's even a fair descriptor, that's been possible for 40 years. It means making web pages. But the convention is that a blog is sort of your online diary. Livejournal.com is one such site. Blogger.com, run by Google, is another such site. It's simply become much more popular for one, people just to talk about their day um, on their blog. Friends perhaps read these. Nobody perhaps read these. It's sort of a strangely inverse voyeuristic way of sort of exposing your life to the world for others to sort of read at will. Um, they've become more in the mainstream these days in the realms of politics, especially with the most recent presidential election where you have pundits actually posting their articles online and sort of calling them blogs, which is sort of a funny thing because any reporter working for a newspaper could publish an article every day. A blogger is simply publishing articles every day, but they're calling them blogs only because it's a little more interactive, a little less official, if you will. But signing up for a blog is as simple as getting a free account on uh, any of the sites that I mentioned or Googling the term blog. Um, it, it, it remains to be seen how um, common these things remain. Right? 10,000 new journal entries a day, that's a lot to keep up with. So we shall see. Instant messaging, we've talked about. Um, instant messaging, though, does fit nicely into this arrangement whereby we, sitting here at my laptop, we're acting as this so-called server, communicating with Ken or Brian by way of AOL's or Google server. So really, what should be in this picture when I was conversing with Brian or Ken on this side? Yeah, exactly. Another client. Simply that server, AIM or Google, was sort of brokering the conversation and relaying the information from one client to another. SFTP, again, just another on our laundry list here, internet application. Secure FTP. We said FTP before is file transfer. You will use secure uh, FTP in sections and workshops so that you can upload files from your local computer to your FAS accounts. So that's different from SSH because you don't really want to control or create the image on the server. You probably want to take it locally and move it there. For instance, if you download an image from the web with a browser and want to upload it to your FAS account, you'll use this. If you want to edit your HTML files, on your local computer and upload them, you'll use Secure FTP. We'll demonstrate this in class. It's very easy to use, um, and all it speaks to is this notion of securely transferring files. No magic. Usenet is sort of a dated technology. Uh, those who were on the internet back in the day would remember such uh, hierarchies as the alt news groups, the biz, the comp, humanities, myths, news, and so forth. These were essentially yesteryear's news groups, bulletin boards, if you will. They're still in use, though, by a geekier community, I would say. Google, actually, if you've ever seen the link on their website to something called Google Groups, which is one of the main links, a few years ago, they bought a company called Deja News, which essentially was just an archiving service for all of these various bulletin boards. It's a brilliant repository of arcane information. So almost always, if I need, from a computer science perspective, an answer to like a technical question that I just can't figure out and the web by way of Google is sort of failing me, 
Google Groups, henceforth for you, should be a wonderful resource because odds are if you have a question that's fairly technical, if esoteric, somebody else out of the billions of people in the world have had that question too. And at least one of them has hopefully posted the question and other people have answered the question. So essentially you have this wonderfully free resource of a ridiculous amount of information on sports, on computers, on other things, really chatty news groups, but it's very powerfully searchable by Google these days, ever since they bought the archives. People are still posting new messages, and you can read new messages by way of Google groups, but frankly I esteem the search capabilities over all others. It's a wonderful way of finding out arcane information. Questions? on the internet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a good question. So there are, there were a number of pop-ups that I glossed over tonight as I tend to do in typical practice. They said a couple of things. One of them was that you were changing from an insecure site to a secure site. Essentially, many browsers, if you change from an address that is at HTTP colon something, but click a link that's on HTTPS colon something, it will inform you that you're, what you're about to view is going to be over a secure connection. Sort of a useful, but sort of annoying message after a while, and so I normally just ignore them. Similarly, will many browsers tell you the reverse? If you're on a secure website, but you're about to be redirected to an insecure website, you know, that could be a security concern. And so most, web, uh, most browsers will inform you of that, but most users like me will ignore that. There are other messages about um, security settings and the types of files that are trying to be downloaded to your computer, and we'll come back to those in the, internet, in the security lectures. But for the most part, they're useful if redundant warnings that most people don't understand, but we'll see more of them in the future. Question? Well, we haven't yet had our daily video, Seinfeld aside, and this one is a teaser of sorts for where we're going next week. Next week, again, is the internet continued, and it will be much less application-oriented and much more detail-oriented on how does the internet work, what is this DHCP server that you need to connect to when you get that new cable modem or DSL modem, what does it mean to be a gigabit ethernet card, how fast is your DSL connection, which should you get, DSL cable modem dial-up, all of these kinds of questions will we pursue. We'll do this by way of a conversation about a protocol, not unlike these, called TCP IP, which even if you haven't understood it, you've probably at least heard the term. And what you're about to see is a teaser trailer for a little video we'll see next week, among other things, uh, written by some guys from Ericsson's lab that I used to work with that gives you a hint at how these things work. So let me restart this from the beginning. Give you some audio. Kill the bad elevator music. And very ungraceful lead into this, yes? We'll see you next week at the Internet Continued.